You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Thomas. So we got a special guest today, which is actually really nice to have in studio. We don't have to try to fiddle with that other technology, but we'll get there eventually. So what are we going to be talking about today? Yeah, we got uh, fortunate to have Neil Quince with us today. And Neil, uh, we were talking, you know, before we started here, uh, he, you hear people talk about how far back we go with the, the opening of Jake's in the old location in the little, little box uh, that we were in probably going on 10 years now. And so uh, Neil remembers that place. And uh, it's been interesting to see him evolve uh, as an angler over the years and uh, where he was and where he is now. And so... Um, Neil, tell us a little bit about, about yourself. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Neil Quince, as Jared said. And, yeah, fishing, uh, specifically bass fishing, is my passion. I think going back to uh, growing up, uh, neither my father or grandfather fished. Um, I had nobody growing up. Uh, it wasn't interesting to me in the least. Uh, I was a hunter. That was my style. Um I enjoyed every fall when it came around, but uh, and even growing up living at Lake Holiday, uh, never really fished it once. Um, fast forward a little bit, uh, post high school, I get into the military, I joined the Marines, I was in the Marine Corps for six years, and then post-military, uh, I did come back to the area, and I was living in Manassas at the time, and Things were good. Uh, I started coaching wrestling. I had a high school team that I was a part of and got that, you know, unit cohesion that I was missing in the military. But when I transferred to Shenandoah University to start taking classes and, you know, really came back home, I needed something to do. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, you can only hunt in the fall. Mm -hmm. And I was looking for other things and an excuse to get outside. I had some close friends of mine that loved bass fishing, and that's how it all started. Um, and I was able to find a little place in town called Jake's Bait and Tackle. <laughs> and yeah, that's, that's kind of where it all got started. I think that's me. interesting, Thomas, how, I mean, I was fortunate. My father, you know, kind of took me fishing, mm-hmm. and so, but not everybody. And I think your story is somewhat similar yeah. in that respect that, you know, we take for granted that not everybody, you know, is, grows up in that environment, if you will. So, you know, where, when or, or where you actually come into the, the sport of fishing and a passion for that is different for everybody. Yeah, and really as the knowledge is generational, usually speaking, it's somebody close to you that gives you the opportunity and opens this door for you to mm-hmm. actually enjoy the great outdoors. Uh, and we were talking a little bit off camera that like this is a very transient area. I mean, I heard some people joke it's like California 2.0 because everyone like comes here. And because of that, I think you lose some of that culture, that outdoor culture mm-hmm. specifically. And it makes it even harder to get involved with mm-hmm. the outdoors versus if you lived in Tennessee or Florida, where it's like you got three generations. And if you mm-hmm. ask somebody about fishing or whatever, they're like, oh, yeah, I can go here, here and here. Mm-hmm. You ask a rando around, you know, Leesburg, mm-hmm. they, they're going to look at you cross-eyed. Like, right. is this a thing you can do? Right. Um, so how getting in this area, like how did you start finding Was it through Jake's bait and tackle? You found out where to go fishing and you started to like talk to us a little bit about that. So, um, it, it all started for me, uh, after I, I figured it out, it actually was at the hospital pond, hmm. uh, at the Winchester medical center, which again, I'm not even sure if you're authorized to fish in there, uh, at some, at some points, but, um, I was told that there was one pond, you know, at a certain time that a buddy and I could go fish. And that's where it started. And it was just, you know, learning. I couldn't even tie my own knot at the time. You know, <laughs> I, I had to go fishing with him because I was like, hey, like, I'll buy the stuff. But here's a hook like here. Mm-hmm. Can you put it on for me? Right. And I'm fishing like in and, and knowing what I know now. I mean, he didn't really know exactly what was going on, but he knew enough. Right. So I'm out there with like straight braid on a bait caster fishing a Sanko. And that's how it became. And it was nice in that farm pond kind of environment Mm -hmm. because you just kind of had to cast out there. You could, you know, practice your hook sets on, you Mm -hmm. know, little 10 inch bass. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it was fun because you're catching it. So, Mm -hmm. you know, when, oh man, this one had it choked. I didn't set the hook quick enough and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I was, that's always a great environment. I feel like to start at Mm -hmm. at that pond level, Mm -hmm. Um, but kind of having nowhere else 
um, and, and friends start to get married and things like that, it became, well, this, I'm, I'm the only guy left doing it. All my mm-hmm. friends that kind of got me started, um, you know, have, have stopped fishing as much as mm-hmm. I wanted to. Um, and it became diving into social media, YouTube videos, mm-hmm. and kind of like self learning. I mm-hmm. was like, look, what are the techniques that I have to do to catch the most fish? Mm-hmm. I got three hours. I'm not trying to go out and get skunked. I mean, that's, that was always my goal. Like, I just need one. Like, let me, like, just mm-hmm. an hour after work before dark, I just want to go get one. Um, I spent a lot of times on Google Earth, Google Maps, yeah. mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like, you know, trying to find, a, to ask for permission for places to go. Mm-hmm. Um, but then it just became easier. What are the closest public spots I've got? Right? Yeah. Um, and, and again, we did talk off camera. The, the Shenandoah River, mm-hmm. it would be the closest geographically to mm-hmm. me. Um, bank fishing a river, you know, that that can be a little tough. Um, it's yeah. frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it's nice if you know where the hole is and you can go right to mm-hmm. it. Um, but there's a lot of private property and things like mm-hmm. that. Where am I going to park my vehicle? You know, can I just park it and then walk for, mm-hmm. you know, miles up the river and wade fish like that? Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I'm not going to do that when, when the water temperature starts getting below, you yeah. know, 60. So mm-hmm. that kind of limits you. And then you go out of a place like a Lake Frederick, um, mm-hmm. which is another, you know, it's a great place to do, but you're limited to the banks in there. Mm-hmm. And then I always heard about this Lake Holiday place. And mm-hmm. shoot, I even used to live there. But unless you're a resident, you don't get to enjoy those fruits of that. Mm-hmm. So you would always hear like, yeah, we tore them up today. I'm like, man, I got skunked at Frederick. Where were you guys? Mm-hmm. Like, oh, we were up at Lake Holiday. Mm-hmm. So that became another piece is like, well, like, you know, so I'm, I'm really limited to Lake Frederick and the Shenandoah River mm-hmm. for a realistic time to fish. Mm-hmm. Um, for me in my location in Winchester, I've got to look at if I do want to make that trip to Anna, I mean, I'm nearly planning a weekend for that. I mean, Mm -hmm. you might as well dedicate a day, you know, that's not Mm -hmm. something I can go hit after work, Mm -hmm. um, and things like that. So I think that kind of makes you unique too, though. Um, you know, when you think about when you break fishing down and, you know, this area, we've got, you know, the river rats, you know, and if you have, you know, some guys are fishing out of their jet boats, you know, and they're flying up the river, going up the South Fork. Uh, can go into that shallow water um, in a bass boat, you know, versus the kayak or canoeist. I know I started off bank fishing, but also yeah. canoeing with one of my mm-hmm. buddies. And we would, you know, do float trips, we called them. We'd put in one location and take out at another and fish the yeah. river. And so, you know, and some people have the glass boats. They're exclusive lakes. They're going to Lake, you know, Lake Anna, Smith Mountain Lake, your big lakes, big bodies of water. Uh, but what makes you unique, I think, is that you're kind of a hybrid in that you will – uh, you now do, you fish out of a boat and you'll fish uh, Riverton, the Shenandoah River, as well as Lake Frederick, Lake Holiday, mm-hmm. and the other lakes. And so uh, maybe just talk to, to our listeners, you know, about uh, each one of those different places and because uh, they definitely yeah. fish differently. A river's oh, yeah. going to fish differently than, sure. than the lake. So, you know, but you seem to have success in both areas. So what kind of approach do you take in those different local bodies of water and yeah. not not to cut you off so and the boat for everyone to listen so boat wise uh what, what are you running right now right now i have a bass tracker 185 it's an aluminum boat okay. and with a 60 horsepower mercury okay uh, and i run a prop prop okay and so. that's just good since we are in the river we talked about mm-hmm. kayak stuff yeah. he is running a prop and so the places that he'll be talking about are places that if you have a prop this is some place that you might be able to have a- access to that's a good point absolutely um and, and i think just real quick before i get mm-hmm. into that I, we talked about it. There is that progression that mm-hmm. we talked about. Mm-hmm. You got to have, you know, uh, we don't have a huge Texas lake that we grew up on. I mean, unfortunately, mm-hmm. around here, um, if you're blessed to live on Smith Mountain or mm-hmm. Lake Anna, um, but it's just not realistic, at least for me and my budget to own a big glass boat. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't live close enough to anywhere to utilize it enough. Mm-hmm. And I mean, and, and look at um, some of our friends that have the really nice boats. They don't get near as much use out of it mm-hmm. as they would love to um so i just didn't see it fitting for me also if the water's low it, at certain areas and ramps become you know questionable with the drought um i'm not afraid to put my aluminum in um 
So that's one thing for me about running that. But it's funny you mentioned that because my cousin, I was sending him the pictures of smallmouth you recently uh, caught, and we'll, we'll try to post those. Yeah, the, the, as well, we'll overlay them. And uh, he kind of he he laughed because he said, and that's the progression he had. He was running a, a decked out John boat, and he spent a lot of time same thing Lake Frederick and, and Riverton. Mm-hmm. And he and he kind of he said, I miss miss those days, you know, on the river because now he has a glass boat and he, he doesn't take it down there. So. Yeah, that, that is a very true statement. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then for the viewers at home that aren't in the area. So out of Front Royal, Virginia, you can look on a map. You have really three places that we're talking about right now. It's Lake Frederick. Um, it's Riverton. Riverton is actually the area. If you cross over, what, what road is that? Uh, 522 going into Front Royal. 522 going into Front Royal, and there's a dam. And so right there, it it backs up the Shenandoah River where the two forks connect, and that creates a place that you could put a bigger boat. Mm -hmm. Uh, Many tournaments go out of there, and then you also have Lake Holiday, which we'll get into here in a minute as well, which is a a privately owned lake, Mm -hmm. Um, but it's it's comparable to the same size as Lake Frederick. And so those are the three areas. If you're not from this place, if you wanted to do some research, at least you know know where. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and with my progression, it didn't take me long to discover that I needed to get out there. I, mm-hmm. I was, I was, I got, you know, not really fed up with the bank, but I was ready for more. You know, I, every time I would show up and I'd see the guys launch their boats, you know, I, I would kind of like think to myself, like, man, like, that's going to be me one day, you know? Mm-hmm. So you're kind of always looking for that next step. Um, I, I didn't go the kayak route. I, I kind of thought I'm just going to save up and invest and, and, and get a, a realistic bass boat for mm-hmm. myself, which is where, you know, the Bass mm-hmm. Tracker Aluminum became a, a great mm-hmm. fit for me. Um, it's something that I can take to a bigger lake. I've had my boat out on Lake Erie, Lake St. Clair, and you the have Detroit balls, River. Sir. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I'll take that thing anywhere, um, but I can also put it out on the river. So I, I've, I've learned to travel around, but I guess we'll start with the Shenandoah River mm-hmm. and um, the, the part of Riverton um, that, that you had addressed, uh, the confluence where the North and South Fork meet. Um, the ramp most of the time is, is, is pretty clear. Even if the water's low, uh, you can get a boat out of there. Uh, you got to take it easy till you get down to the confluence. And then it opens up, I would say, a five to five and a half mile stretch of water where you can run there's there's nothing stopping you from you know going full blast there's no speed regulations or anything um and it's good water there's a couple bridges that you have to be careful for but mm-hmm. but other than that it's mm-hmm. fairly open um and for those who don't know that first bridge you come to he was talking about the confluence it'll be a train bridge mm-hmm. and uh if you make a right you would go up the south fork but everything he's gonna be talking about is down from that bridge to the left down river yeah um so i i've personally um i've gone up as far as i was comfortable with mm-hmm. with my prop on on both sides but mm-hmm. I'm, I'm looking for any depth that's you know at least over three and a half feet before i even put the trolling motor down mm-hmm. um and that again a, a big adjustment for me um how do i fish the river I, what do i do besides of word of mouth you know i don't know anybody from this area i've got no experience and my first time going out there um i have to try to find this information mm-hmm. so you start googling you know and youtubing and a lot of things come up uh with professional anglers you know and they're talking about these big huge lakes and how to fish and talking about shad and i'm like what is a shad Mm -hmm. and then i come to find out that we really don't even have shad Mm -hmm. around these areas where i'm fishing so i'm like i'm buying all these like white little shad stuff and finding some success but i'm like yeah i'm not like i'm not seeing any of this stuff on my graph that everybody's talking about and and that's the hardest part too because it it is the the overall media narrative and this is not a negative thing is what sells and it's what tournaments what bodies of water tournaments are held on because that honestly for the fishing market generally speaking is where everything is tilted towards mm-hmm. so you're talking gunnersville the tva systems you know where do you have big tournaments and that's where we're going to get content for mm-hmm. and where you have the knowledge base but you're right if you're talking about how do i fish a pond how do i fish a river that is average four feet deep and maybe mm-hmm. one pool that's 10 no one really talks about that and it's uncharted waters no pun intended and it's hard to find information on that and you can, you have just to go out there and just learn on your own unless mm-hmm. you know one dude that does it mm-hmm. it's not easy information to and get and that it. goes to why you wanted to start this thomas yeah I mean, just because we you felt like there was nothing in this area exactly what you're saying mm-hmm. That caters to this area. Yeah, because I, yeah, I remember when I was starting to fish Leaders Lake way back when, when it wasn't completely, you know, um, 
built up with houses that yeah i would go through the bass masters like okay you need to throw a nine inch bastard swim bait let's try this thing it's like god damn this is bigger than everything that's in here but i'm yeah. not getting bit but this is what mm -hmm. they told me and then after years i like okay only some of this you can just plug in place and it's going to work for mm -hmm. you you've got to adapt to where you're fishing mm -hmm. And, and exactly, it's to be able to get that information out to everyone that lives in this area, or if you're going to come by here and you want to fish, because we have fantastic, I think Virginia is one of the best rivers. You could have a fantastic either jet boat or kayak smallmouth trail, and you could hit the New River, the James, the Shenandoah, the Potomac, the Rappahannock, and then the Susquehanna. Like, that's insane. And most of them are right in this, in this state. Uh, but no one talks about that enough. They really don't. Um, but not not to cut you off to get, to get yeah, back no. to it like like how for this river uh, uh, for, for the people listening at home how do you approach it um and we could go the full year or do you just want to just start with right now um in the fall time either way you can just yeah yeah whatever you want to go yeah so uh i guess biggest takeaways for me is once i found that that section where i knew mm -hmm. i could go and you know depending on the weather conditions um is kind of mm -hmm. where i always start mm -hmm. um whenever you're looking at any river, specifically the Shenandoah that does flow from south to north, mm -hmm. not only do you have to look at the rain and weather patterns in this area, but how much rain did we get down south? Mm -hmm. Because I had an incredible day recently out fishing and I go out the following day and the conditions had completely changed. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, we didn't get a drop of rain. And I was like, well, shoot, like down south, mm -hmm. you know, now it looks like chocolate milk is mm -hmm. what is fishing. Um, and I guess some of the biggest things that, you know, I was learning when I first started was looking for eddies and things like that. Cause I don't know what that is like slack water. And I'm just looking at a river that is flowing. I'm like, I mean, I don't, we don't have like, you know, it's, it's fairly a small river system because mm -hmm. the huge rivers that you do first Google are the Gunnersville and the mm -hmm. TVA lakes that you're thinking about Tennessee river. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, the Shenandoah is, is not quite that, mm -hmm. but it's also so different from the Potomac. Mm -hmm. Um, there's, I'm not fishing grass mats, you know, there's no topwater frogs coming mm -hmm. out on the Shenandoah part that I'm fishing. Mm -hmm. Um, unless there would be conditions where I'm, I'm looking for flooded areas that mm -hmm. had, had possibly come in. But, um, on, on a normal day, I'm looking at weather conditions mm -hmm. are going to be your biggest thing leading into water clarity. Um, you know, I have found success in both. I do prefer when the river is clear. Um, I just feel more comfortable. The, the flow isn't quite as fast. So immediately, if the river is what we would call blown out or if it's up and the, the water is moving quickly, you got to look at, well, when I cast my bait out, mm -hmm. am I going to be able to work it realistically or before it's like blown past me on the mm -hmm. boat where I'm fishing. Do mm -hmm. I want to throw up current or down current? Um, when the river is, is up and it's flowing pretty good, I, I really don't want to bring anything up current. I want to try to go to a heavier weight, whether that be a tube or a crankbait to a spinner bait. Um, anything that I'm throwing a moving bait because it's just not realistic with that water flowing heavy mm -hmm. to try to work something slow on the on bottom. The bottom. You're going to catch a snag. And that's the other thing. Uh, it can it can be frustrating um, depending on the conditions. Uh, boat control and boat positioning is going to be important. Um, but if you're working either, we'll just go with Route 66 Bridge um, that you know you're familiar with. If you know the Shenandoah, it's a popular area and, and it's known to to hold some quality fish. Um, well, when the river's flowing, really, you know anything above four feet above normal. Um, you can't throw anything, I guess, downriver and pull it up. I just find myself getting snagged, and you're just going to go through lures mm -hmm. and weights and baits. Um, so I'm looking for something heavier a weight-wise. I would normally try to switch over to a bait casting gear uh, versus um, a spinning rod. And then, yeah, cranking and anything that's a moving style, whether it be a swim bait to chatter baits work as well. But, yeah, it, it's just – it's hard to not fish a moving bait when you're dealing with heavy current. Okay. And that's something I think is very important because if, if you're a kid that watches Bass Masters and you watch them on the St. Lawrence River, which is predominantly where they go, mm -hmm. you have in your mind when you fish rivers for smallmouth, you're using six pound test and you're drop shotting 24 seven. That is that river. And that's because of the ecological conditions that make it towards an aquarium and you can see 500 feet. The Shenandoah, I, I don't think it ever gets that clear. And so 
I, I think a lot of people here are like, wait, you're going to use a bait caster and, and stuff for smallmouth? Because very few people do that. Well, that's the Shen the, the St. Lawrence is completely different. There's a lot of rivers, specifically like the Shenandoah, where, yeah, you're using maybe a, a power a power Ned rig on 14 to 15 pound test, and you're using crankbaits and chatterbaits, just like you would largemouth. So don't just think because like the pros go to like one river that that's like all the different rivers. Like, yeah. So, but yeah, continue. and and when you do look for those, you know, highlight YouTube videos or Google searches of what's the best smallmouth baits to catch smallmouth, mm -hmm. your drop shot is coming up, Ned rigs, small little baits. Generally, everything is going to be on a spinning rod with six pound test, and that's kind of like what you do. Well, that's to fish the Great Lakes and this, the you know the mm -hmm. big river systems like the St. Lawrence up in New York. Um, but again, relative to my conditions and where I'm fishing on the Shenandoah, um, those just are not viable options. The The river channel, it gets too tight and the flow is just not realistic. And I know some people, um, and I'm not talking about going out in unsafe conditions, mm -hmm. but when the river is up and it is, the clarity is really bad. And it's like, as soon as you drop your, you know, lure into the water, you can't see it. You know, that was a condition that, kind of scared me i was like well mm -hmm. today's gonna be tough you know I, I didn't i didn't understand you know you can still catch him in those conditions um but my favorite ways to catch them you know are still going to be mm -hmm. like your drop shots and ned rigs and little swim baits i i just put those rods away um i have to focus moving baits mm -hmm. and you know focus areas where honestly where you can just fish mm -hmm. if you can find your boat in a situation where you know you're relatively able to keep it in the same spot, you're in an eddy. Um, when, when the river's up, if you can get behind a piling or on the outside of a river bend where the, the water's starting to slack, those are automatically mm -hmm. the areas that I'm, I'm going to target for those you know darker conditions. If I did switch to kind of a, a bottom you know bouncing bait is what I prefer. I would go to a, a darker color jig. Um, and, and again, um, trying to find a small enough jig but still with a heavy enough head that when i cast out and it hits bottom it's not already 20 yards behind me down current yeah that's definitely um, a, and then boat position you kind of alluded to that's mm -hmm. it can be tough because you want to keep that in the strike zone it, it's you know, a science it's, it's, yeah. you have to learn that current the river and it's it's uh it can be tough it can be a challenge mm -hmm. uh if you're not used to fishing the river so jig heads like mm -hmm. if you uh not getting into baits but just weights if you had to give somebody like a, a four different weights um for any flow rate what what yeah. would in your suggestion be if, if there's somebody that wants to come into the shop or, or anywhere yeah. to get stuff what what sizes if you had to pick four okay so automatically anything that is above one ounce um i don't even worry about because okay. there's no conditions on any lake that i fish um between lake holiday lake frederick and the shenandoah river i do not go over one ounce um if i were getting to the potomac um i would consider it but at least for the the three rivers that and bodies of water that we're focusing on today nothing over an ounce and the baits that I do have that are one ounce, I'm maybe going to have one or two of them is all. And it's going to be a, a green pumpkin and a black and blue. Um, all of my money is invested in between one quarter or a quarter ounce, three eighths ounce and a half ounce. Mm -hmm. That's I, good. Yeah. I generally don't go below a quarter, especially in the river, because you, you do get in those situations where if you do have a little bit of flow, it's just hard to keep it in the strike zone. Mm -hmm. Um I think a quarter ounce um, on spinning gear, of course, whether it be a finesse jig or just a small Texas rig or a tube headed jig that you can kind of work with the current and it gets down there when the river is, is really slow. That's what I'm going to. And then accordingly, I'll, I'll then go to a three eighths. Mm -hmm. um, again, all this could change. I could have completely clear conditions, but if it's really windy out, then I could bump up my weight as well because mm -hmm. I want to be able to, you know, either feel the bottom or I just need to get it down to a depth in general. But around here for these areas, um, there's no punching mats or you yeah. know, nothing that I need to drag around a huge, you know, ounce and a quarter, or ounce and a half jig on the bottom. Um, you know, I'm not the large mouth that I do target are, you know, not 10 plus pounders. Um, Frederick is known to, to hold, you know, some big fish like that, 
but generally speaking, um, you know, I'm, I'm not throwing anything over an ounce. They're my cleanest looking jigs in my tackle box because I don't use them. Mm -hmm. It's it's three eighths. It would be probably the go to all around that you can get by with. It's all right in wind. You can feel that river bottom pretty good, or you can drag it around at Lake Frederick. And same thing with a half. So those are going to be like, okay. I guess the long answer. No, of, no of yeah. My weights. No, that, um, that's that fantastic because it's hard for for somebody to know. And I think flow rate was a big thing you you hit on is understanding like you have to match the weight so it doesn't get swept with the current. That that's crucial. And mm -hmm. you can't throw a brick because you're going to get snagged every time. So there is a weird science there about making mm -hmm. sure you have just enough weight to keep it there in contact mm -hmm. without it getting flown down or getting snagged on everything. Now before we switch to like, like Frederick, I have a couple more questions. Like so. A river does fish, a, a legit river that's not tidal, fishes different than a lake and how you approach patterning, if you pattern at all. And when you're going out there and tell the audience a little bit about how long do you spend in an area before you move? And so like if you go to a Lake Frederick, which we'll get to, that place is more pressure than some places in Japan. And so you, you know in your heart of hearts that maybe, yeah, you have to sit in an area all day until you get a bite. Do you approach the river that way or do you have a mental clock of I'm going to be here for so long before I bug out to another place? Like how, how do you approach like f knowing if this spot's going to be good for the river? How long do you spend there? OK, uh, I, I think first step um, is going to be I'll, I'll check the parking lot. If I feel like there's a lot of pressure that day or mm. there's a lot of people out on the water, the first open chance that I get is where i don't see a boat around i'll put the trolling motor down so i'm talking as soon as the confluence ends mm -hmm. and i feel like there's a lot of people up there in the parking lot i'm gonna start fishing um one thing i have learned about uh the shenandoah and river specifically is these fish will move overnight very rarely do i find them in a certain area and they're there the following week or even the next day i've seen um and I think you get that a lot with with these natural river systems. So they are um, very are pressured. They can't get pressured by any yeah. The, the pressure's okay. there, and um, they're just going to move. Um, whether that be you, and not even enough to notice, but if the river just dropped a couple inches, that's going to move the bait around and things like that. So um, that's why I try to, rep you know, not fish off any memories of what I did the following weekend or even the day before i mean obviously it's hard not to mm -hmm. not to hit yeah. areas where i know i've caught them before um but the first thing i do is is that's why i just i forget about where i caught them before and i just try to put the troll motor down early in a, in a place where i maybe wasn't catching them the day before now i will use some of the same techniques and things like that but as far as areas um they do change and, and they will move um, so let's say you caught him in in place A uh, last weekend. Okay. You go over to place A uh, this weekend. Do you spend half your day there, an hour, ten minutes, like in, in a vagary? Like how long do you think you're going to be like until? Yep, they're not here. Um, are, are river fish? Are they generally more aggressive? Like you're going to know real quick if they're there before you pull the trolling motor, or do you feel like you can sit on a spot? Generally speaking. Yeah. Um, so. I've had maybe a maybe a handful of days in my entire life fishing the river where I could sit on a spot okay. more than an hour, honestly. Really? Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm moving. If mm -hmm. if they if I'm not getting bites, it doesn't mean they're not there, but I don't know if it's a timing thing or something like that. But I'm I'm getting out of there pretty quick. Okay. And and the nice thing about the river, you do have the current. Um, I use it to my advantage, so I always try to start above mm -hmm. wherever that target area is trying to fish, mm -hmm. and I, I get my boat positioned, you know, so it's I'm using my trolling motor more or less to have a controlled drift mm -hmm. is how I'm fishing. Mm -hmm. So that's another reason that kind of helps me, you know, fish a spot, you know, fairly thorough. If I feel like I'm like putting the trolling motor or, you know, put it on like spot lock, where I'm like trying to stay in one area too long, um, I, I know that if I'm not getting bites, I need to adjust what I'm doing. And it could be I was fishing an area that was four feet off the bank, mm -hmm. and now they're out in the middle of the mm -hmm. channel. So after I kind of go through that phase of, mm -hmm. of fishing an area like thoroughly and not just going down the bank. Yeah, that, yeah that's um, a good point. I think the nice thing about the Shenandoah River is not so wide that it de definitely follows seasonal patterns. Mm-hmm. 
and then it does give you an opportunity to, and you were talking about high water, they always say high water, bang the, you know, pound the banks, they're going to be nose of the bank type thing, but you can, even so, you see lay downs along the bank, you know, fish that, um, like, and like you say, you can troll just slightly, you can even turn around and cast to the middle of the river then too, and work that middle of the river where you're going to have ledges and boulders and, you know, things in the middle, yep. so those fish really, I always talk about bank to bank, you know, don't limit yourself. And then also think of the water column top to bottom, but um, it's not so wide that you can really position yourself. Cover You can cover a lot of water and then mm -hmm. probably start to narrow down um, a, a, some sort of pattern. You yeah. hit something that's very important for people that haven't fished a Shenandoah. This is not the Mississippi or the St. Lawrence where you have, it, it is extremely broad. And so I think you said something about pressure and boat positioning. You know, it, you do you have to make your mind up that, okay, if I want to fish the right bank, do I set my boat up right down the middle? Because if I do that, does that does the fish feel that pressure of that boat? Is that something where you're like, okay, if I'm going to fish the right bank, I got to make sure I'm really up against the left bank to make that bomb cast to make sure those fish don't feel my pressure. I mean, how, how, how much do the fish feel that and how would you set up your boat to, to attack a place? Yeah, ultimately, yeah, I always start above the flow of where I want to fish because I know when I get into that area, if I want to stay there, my trolling motor is going to have to be on. Mm -hmm. And if we're looking at clear conditions and the water is low, I feel like that is going to affect the fish. Um, specifically if I hook one and I notice that I've got multiples coming in with it and it's following me, um, I may think about just letting the boat just kind of drift and then I will come back up river and kind of do the same thing again with like, again, a controlled drift. I never want to stay on the trolling motor. My foot is on the pedal and that mm -hmm. prop is running. I'm always just, just a little adjustment to maybe keep the boat lined up. You know, so, so you're making your cast, so you're above your target, and then you're making your cast to the target that way, just so everyone can kind of visualize it when you say above the flow. Yeah, essentially. Okay. So it, I, I will I will set the boat up before I get to that spot, and I'm going to be kind of going in reverse, drifting backwards okay. into where I want to go. That way, um, you know, I, I'm off the trolling motor and things like that. But to, to what Jared was saying, um, I, I think visually and, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's a little bit easier to think about a concept where if you can see a target to kind of cast at it and, you know, beating the banks is, is probably the easiest way to fish because, you know, I'm going to throw up, you know, in the shallow water and I'm going to drag it down. Um, and whether or not you have electronics or not, I'll be completely honest. Uh, I don't mark fish on my hummingbird units and go back and fish them. Um, I, I have, you know, before, you know, video game fish where I, where I can mark something on my hummingbird, um, but I don't have live target or anything like that. All I'm looking for is depth and, you know, what the bottom is, which, again, is something that can be done, you know, with a heavy weighted jig or tube bait or something. Mm -hmm. You know, you can you can feel a transition. Mm -hmm. Am I in kind of like, you know, pea gravel bottom or do I got heavy boulders and things like that? Are there big striations? Mm -hmm you know, that I'm seeing and stuff like that on a graph. So this, I, by no means am I using, you know, fancy graph equipment. And it's yeah. stuff that, again, you can use um, even if, if you just put a little weight out, um, you know, a drop shot weight, mm -hmm. don't even tie a lure on. You can kind of feel your depth mm -hmm. and things like that that you're, that you're working with. But the middle of the river is kind of that unseen territory because it's, it's hard to fish. Um, to be honest, especially if you don't have the electronics and equipment like that, um, you're not really throwing at a target and it's easy to feel like, am, am I throwing at nothing? Like what's mm -hmm. out here? There's really no target to see if I'm not able to, to mark the rocks and things and brush piles, like everyone's talking about online and on YouTube videos, I'm not able to do those types of things. Um, so again, it, it becomes a feel thing. So when I do get into a slow time, I find myself drifting out into the middle and I'm just using the river to kind of ride it mm -hmm. out. And, you know, I'm just kind of junk fishing, you know, mm -hmm. um, go back to dragging a worms or drop shots, you know, downsize. That's when I really start, start going through the cycles. And I think one thing about the river too, that the, uh, you know, the, the, the fact of the current and the, the fish are going to be more aggressive in the river system than they are in the lake because of the nature of the current. 
and food's moving, so they've got to react and respond, or mm-hmm. well, they're not eating. And so, but if you get into that slack water, I've seen too where. If you do get in there, in this time of year, really, it can get crystal clear. And so, of course, if you can see down in there, they can see you. Uh, but if you do spook a fish or you see a fish and it's not eaten, just make that mental note. And like you're saying, float to the middle, float down, go ahead and fish that. But I always try to make you know mental note, come back in the next 20 minutes or so, stay off of that fish and throw to it. And I've caught fish that way by mm-hmm. you know kind of sight fishing. May not get initially, but mm-hmm. just make a mental note and, and come back around to it. Yeah, absolutely. Um that again that's something common with the river it Mm -hmm. becomes easier because um outside of you know kind of controlling your drifts and things Mm -hmm. like that you are able to cover that water Mm -hmm. and when the bite does get tough um smallmouth are are notoriously aggressive they'll let Mm -hmm. you know generally where they are um if if the water is super clear long casts and things like that um you know and just kind of change it up but again uh, conditions are depending and these fish are moving constantly, mm-hmm. but they're so much fun. I mean, this, yeah. this, oh, yeah. the small mouth, I think we all agree. There's something special about fighting a small mouth in the river current. Um, that the large mouth are fun too, yeah. but a, a nice small mouth is, is really fun. It, I did want to know too, uh, you know, when I remember when I was younger growing up, um, and I'd read articles about, you know, fishing can be really great small mouth fishing in February, you know, and I, I like Neil, I fished, but my, my schedule was kind of bow hunted, a muzzleloader hunt, rifle hunted. I do a little bit of bird hunting and trout fishing in the month of January and February. And then I coached baseball, so I really didn't have the spring of the year. And then, you know, I'd only fished the river in the summertime. And then when, you know, Dad opened Jake's, you know, we started hearing from the anglers, uh, getting more of that information and just that, that same, that held true that, you know, and I see where some of the largest uh, smallmouth all year will be caught between November, December to February, March. That window that, and you got to think most people, uh, obviously diehard river rats, they know this and they're, the, mm-hmm. they're, they're going to hate me for sharing this. But, um, and a lot of people think, well, you, you don't fish in the wintertime. It's cold out. Well, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's some of your best fish can come during the winter months mm-hmm. yeah so. and so before we change like to, to the other bodies of water in the area could, could you give your three generic baits that you would have tied on for the people at home to understand like the three baits that you would tie on from now in november to february like what were three baits somebody should go out and get if they're trying to take their kid fishing okay uh my first bait is going to be just a simple quarter ounce jig head right just to me which <laughs> Any sort of minnow style bait. Uh, there's no brand specific. Um, I use everything from like a Demiki Armor Shad to, you know, a Strike King, uh, little small plastic swim bait, little Kytex and things like that work. But anything that's light with little action. And when I'm working that again, I'm kind of just letting the river do its thing. Um, it's not really a controlled retrieve it's like a spy um, bait sort of speak where it's just just a slow yeah yes thing. yeah essentially like that and it's something that i want to in my mind i want to just think that all right i'll throw it out let it hit bottom and then i don't want it to hit bottom again i don't want to bump anything mm-hmm. i just am visualizing that all right so i got it about you know six inches to a foot and a half off the bottom and that's my retrieve how i'm working it that way um the ned rig would be my next go-to um by far um both the the z-man large trd and the small one um and i like to say that i catfish with those because that's you're throwing it out and i'm just watching my line you know you really gotta don't you know sometimes less is more in those situations And the the best feeling that you could get is when you think that you're hung up, mm-hmm. but then you feel a nice head shake and it's like, man, I just, I wasn't doing anything with it. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's really dumb fishing, but it's cold. You know, most of the time I'm going to have gloves on this time of year. So I just, you know, I'm very slow how I'm working my Ned rig. Are you throwing that Ned rig at a 45 up current and letting the current kind of take it down or are you... How are you working yeah, I, so I'm I'm working everything. If it's not at a 45, uh, it's up, up current, current and, and coming back Dragging down. The speed of your boat. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and That's so people like if you don't know this, don't cast downstream and bring it back. Generally mm-hmm. speaking, like so when he's talking about everything, is thinking if if the if the current's hitting you in the face, 
most of your casts are going up mm -hmm. so it comes with the current or like you said at a 45 degree mm -hmm. angle but generally speaking i've had some kids in my boat too when i've gone out and they bomb cast it backwards and drag it up and it no bueno that's not something you want to be doing but just to add that, that little yeah not there. to keep it too simple but for those <laughs> that haven't done it and you just kind of let the current i mean you're drifting plus the current is is working that at a speed of the current mm -hmm. which is kind of i think fish too they kind of are used to that and you might just occasionally have to you know pick it up and tap you know just kind of work it but like you're saying keep it on the bottom the do nothing technique yeah yep. and and you can do it again um a ned rig I, I i also in the same category as that i will go to a a jig a, a small finesse mm -hmm. jig mm -hmm. is also in that both of these are going to be on light line setups i'm throwing anywhere from six to eight pound oh, test wow. fluorocarbon mm -hmm. is all i'm throwing on that and hang-ups are going to happen and things like that but when it's super cold um that's what i'm looking to work uh i want it on the bottom moving slow and mm -hmm. pulling it down with the current i just feel like if you do like what you talked about bringing it kind of up the current um i don't think the fish get as much of a chance mm -hmm. to look yeah. at that they're used to you know either sitting behind boulders or rocks mm -hmm. or little eddies and and the the food is coming down towards them to ambush it and when you bring it out i think of it i don't want to bring it back it's past its tail you know i want them to see it identify it and then him be able to make the move on it for my best chance to get it mm -hmm. not saying that you could throw down river and pull it up and catch a fish that's completely possible but what i feel like is giving me my best chance is to work it with the current mm -hmm. and then my third option is going to be a jerk bait um a deep diving jerk bait really yeah okay. um i use the mega bass vision 110 plus one that's my only jerk bait that i throw this time of year i have confidence in that um i use suspend dots as well because i'm fishing in a river um so what they are they're just i don't know if anybody's familiar with those or the viewers but they're basically little pieces of lead they look like uh like a hole punch mm -hmm. And they have it's just just a lead sticky piece of paper mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll just put them you know put three or four of them on the bottom just to add a little bit of weight to a jerk bait because in the current um i really want it to get down and suspend and it's it, i don't need it to stay there because i know it's going to be drifting so it's hard to work a jerk bait in a river um so that's why putting the suspend dots on it for me um make it a little bit easier to cast and we'll slow it down enough in the river so that I can work it. What kind of cadence are you working with? The, with yeah. The so bed? when it's, uh, obviously the colder, the water, um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just letting again, everything is current and boat dictated. So going back mm -hmm. to like boat position and the current flow, um, I'm really only reeling up my slack and, and it's more not the cadence I have found doesn't matter. Um, more or less it's, it's how hard are you snapping it? Um, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes, you know, I'll do a couple quick snaps with it, get it down and it's literally just floating and I'll just start reeling up and maybe give it a pop every one to two seconds. Um, and, and have found success doing that. Or sometimes, uh, I'll, I've worked it super quick as, as soon as it hits the water, I'm snapping it and reeling in constantly. Mm -hmm. As soon as I can get back to the boat, those work it well. Um, I think it really just depends on what either mood the fish are doing yeah, or if yeah, you're in an area, right. but, uh, yeah, it's completely different in a lake. Um, I'm not afraid to work it super fast, even when the water's cold and, and to get back to what you said, this is a magic time of year, mm -hmm. uh, for, for the rivers specifically, um, mentally when I, when I know it's starting to get cold and the water temperatures in the lakes are below the fifties, I am on the river. Like, I will not go back to the lakes until late March. I was going to ask you that question, like, because you fish both, kind of what dictates in your mind, like, oh, I'm going to the lake today versus I'm going to the river, if there was any rhyme or reason yeah. to your choice of river over lake. Yeah. Kind of um, water temperature. The Shenandoah is a strange animal. Um, the, this, the part of the river, and again, I'm only speaking for this Riverton stretch because I'm, I'm really unfamiliar with, with any other parts of the river. Um, but the Riverton section of Shenandoah, um, throughout the summer months and things like that, um, you can go catch a lot of fish. Um, I always joke I might go catch 100 fish for like three pounds. 
because you'll get a lot of bites, but the, the quality of fish aren't there. Like if I catch a two pounder in July, I mean, that's like going to be the fish of the day for sure. I'm not exactly sure why that is. Um, I, I haven't found where they go, but I just know when, when the water temperature warms up and it's around that spawning time, um, they disappear and it's like, all right, I'll see you in October. It's kind of what happens there. <laughs> so my time that I fish the river, um, is I'm focusing on the October until the spawn. That's when, um, I, I feel like the fishing the river is the best for that stretch. Um, it's deeper water. It's a great wintering hole. And I just believe that I think that's, you know, why they're in those areas. Cause maybe they do go up river and get to the areas where the jet boats, um, have access to it that yeah. I don't. Um, but when the water temperature starts to cool down, it, it's a magical time. Um, and likewise, less people are out fishing pleasure boaters, uh, the jet skis get put away. Um, kind of have it to yourself. Yeah. A lot of hunters, uh, are in the tree stand mm -hmm. and there's plenty of days where it's like, wow, I'm the only mm -hmm. one that's, out that's here. Right. And I, I, be said yeah. about that. I got one more question before we, before yeah. we switch to the lake. So everyone says winter time is great. So if I'm taking my kid or my brother, or whatever, do I just pick any winter day or is there specific conditions? Cause I know like in the springtime through the summer, generically speaking, as long as there's no tornado, you can go out and probably catch something. Mm -hmm. You know, the weather can't be terrible, but I feel like the winter time is a little bit different. Is it like every single day you can go out there and have success? Or are there some days that you're like, I'm just not going out. It's not worth it. Like okay. if you had to pick conditions where maybe safety wise, mm -hmm. it's a problem, but then like you actually have a chance to catch. Is that the case in the winter time when you're fishing? Yeah. So my, and I would, are you every fisherman's worst nightmare is cold, dirty water. Okay. It becomes, um, because I, as I said previously, I'm working quick moving baits with possible lethargic fish. And, you know, I, my confidence starts to go down there because I already know that I'm not going to get a lot of bites today mm -hmm. and I'm working. I'm, I've eliminated my top three go-to lures for that time mm -hmm. because the flow is going to be up and the water is going to be stained. Um, so I would say any condition that has good clarity. Yes, absolutely. Uh, if you find a, a deep hole or if you go to Riverton, you will catch fish. And quite possibly, it could be your biggest fish of the year. Um, and let me say, too, real quick, the, the numbers, you're talking about no, numbers in the summer, number quantity of fish are going to go down. Like some guys go out, too. They'll fish five, six hours, and they may only get one bite. But like it, In the wintertime, yeah. It is the yeah. biggest fish. You might get, you know, four or five bites or, you know, get four or five in the boat. You're not going to have the quantity, and it just makes it tough when you're out there and it's cold, but the quality of fish tend to be better. Yeah, yeah. Um, from a tournament fishing perspective, I'll get into that at Riverton because tournaments do go out of there. Mm -hmm. um, any month that is outside of our late fall to early spring time, I, w I would expect a quality to winning bag coming out of there would be to 12 to 13 pounds range realistically. And that's going to come from a mixed bag of both largemouth and smallmouth. Um, in the warmer conditions, if the water temperature is above 70, I would say that's realistic. Um, I've had multiple 20 pound bags in the colder months. That's nuts. Just, just mm -hmm. for a perspective. So and that's mm -hmm. something that's hard to do. April anyway. to October, 12 to 13. And then October to April, you're mm -hmm. talking 20 plus around yeah, that. 20, that's insane. Wow. Not, and it's not just me. Um, mm -hmm. I've, I've seen other 20 pound bags out there. And it can realistically be done. Um, I've seen 20, 21, and 22 pounds win tournaments, whether mm -hmm. that be with Shenandoah Valley or North Mountain. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Um, Holy moly. <laughs> yeah. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's incredible. Um, and it, for whatever reason, this time of year, during the summer, you kind of can get bit everywhere. Um, but it's more or less like when you do find that area or that school of fish, they're together and they're big. Mm -hmm. And if if I have a spot where I just caught a three, I'm gonna stay there because a four mm -hmm. is coming. You know, it's that's that's why I'm out there. That's why I'm freezing and mm -hmm. it's cold and it's mm -hmm. windy and it sucks. Um, 
I'm going to get it, hopefully at least five bites, but they're going to be, mm-hmm. you know, the five quality the right bites ones yeah. that I'm looking for. And again, it makes it worth it. You forget mm-hmm. about your fingers are freezing and, you know, you can't hardly mm-hmm. breathe because it's so cold. I've had it where like my eyelets are starting to freeze up as mm-hmm. I'm reeling in. Um, you can't hardly cast because your line is frozen. Mm-hmm. Yep. Those are the days where um, the big small mouth are still going to bite. And it's just such a... Um, you can be so close to them, but so far away. I've had days where, I mean, you're out there for like six hours and you don't get a bite and mm-hmm. you're like scratching your head. Mm-hmm. And then you just happen to finally hit a spot where one bites and it's like they were all there. Um, so it can be, it's more mentally challenging yeah. because the bites are not there. So mm-hmm. it's easy to get discouraged um, for sure. If, if you're unfamiliar with anything, um, it, you just got to, you know, you got to put your time in. Mm-hmm. Um, but Anything I've learned, there's no secret lure. There's no secret technique. Um, there's nothing magical about like what I'm able to do that someone else isn't doing. Mm-hmm. It's just that you know I've put the time in and I understand. There's been plenty of times where I'll fish with someone else in the boat with me. And I will tie the exact same lure on. Exact same weight, same trailer, color, everything. And... For whatever reason, they're not getting the bites. So it's just something, I guess, subconsciously, how I'm able to work it on the bottom. And those are just things that you'll have to learn. You can still watch all the videos, set yourself mm-hmm. up by all the gear. I can set you up, give you my all my setups, um, tell you where I was catching them. But, mm-hmm. you know, they, again, they might not be there. So you just kind of yeah. got to keep that That's a very good point. I mean, time on the water, and I know I struggle with that. I don't go enough consecutive days or not even consecutive just enough in a season to to you know figure things out i mean you got to spend time on the water i mean that that's your yeah, best you way to, to learn and yeah and to uh you know have the opportunity to even catch fish mm-hmm. and, and the nice thing about the shenandoah um and i'm just going to compare something complete opposite like lake st Clair that i've gone and fished up in michigan um I, I i go back to revert to the same thing i'm like how do i fish Lake St. Clair. I'm like Googling stuff again. It's like, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm reverting back to what I was doing 10 years ago. And one of the big things was it's like, hey, find out where the bass boats are and just get Mm -hmm. close to them. Yeah. I found that didn't work for me. You know, I, I, I drive out there. I drive, you know, eight hours, get up there, put my boat in. I got conditions are perfect. I'm out there and it's new body of water for me. And I'm like not getting bites. So... I just go back to my instinct and I go into the mm-hmm. Detroit river because I'm like, well, I know how to fish rivers. Mm-hmm. I fish Shenandoah and I'll go in there and I've had big time success fishing the Detroit river because again, it's something I was used to. So I feel like mm-hmm. the, the, the whole confidence bait, I mean, Hey, if you're catching them at your farm pond, you can take that mm-hmm. to the river. It's I, I don't have the secret to the mm-hmm. bait, but also know that you don't have to fish behind somebody or if you get out there and there is a lot of boats and everybody says oh they're all up at the bridge or something Mm -hmm. like no there there are more places Mm -hmm. than than one there's no secret i don't i mean i have i have multiple places and i go through a rotation and it's where i've caught them in the past Mm -hmm. and if they're not one i'll go to that and when i run through out of all those it's back to the drawing board Mm -hmm. so i i don't um, maybe on, on a bigger lake or something, you know, if you could be on an area where there are winning fish or quality fish, but they're always moving. Yeah. I think, you know, and I, I, I see all the time in here, customers, got, you got to be careful too, with too much information. Um, and I think mm-hmm. in a day and time where we're looking for the exact right hook with the right weight, with the right color, with the right, everything. And I agree with that. I, I always felt like there's no wrong way to fish. And I mean, I've seen guys catch four or five pounders you know with a tube hook and he put a swim bait on it because he didn't have a swim bait hook right and Mm -hmm. it was new to him and he's a heck of a fisherman um Mm -hmm. and stick a five pounder so it's like that is nobody would ever do that like that's just silly but it worked and so i mean not that you want to do that all the time Mm -hmm. um but i'm just saying though don't get so caught up especially if you're new to this don't get so caught up with with having everything (laughs) exactly right i think getting out on the water and and just going at it and then through that process of being on the water you'll begin to figure out what's working what's not working yeah and i call that like the culture of the one percent because so its example is when nike says if you if you buy this shoe it'll make you like 
you know, one third of a second faster. And it's like that works for your elite college athletes mm -hmm. that are looking for that. If you are Joey Bag of Donuts, that doesn't matter to you. It doesn't right. apply. And I think in fishing, we get this issue where it's like, well, it's all about the bait and this. It's like, yeah, if you're an elite angler mm -hmm. and you maybe need two more bites a year to cash a check, mm -hmm. absolutely, I think the bait thing can mm -hmm. matter. But if you are literally trying to go out there and just catch something, mm -hmm. that that same type of mindset doesn't apply to right. you. It's not about the bait. It's learning how to fish a river mm -hmm. in the body of water. Right. If you get around them, mm -hmm. you don't have to have the specific secret bait to at least have a little bit of success. Exactly. So, yeah, thank you guys. Neil, thank you for coming on. We're definitely going to have you back on again. Thanks again, guys. Everything from the episode will be in the episode description. This has been Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. Who's this here? Jared Mounts. We'll see you next time. See ya. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. 